also right now just started record and you will be able to find this um, to review um, in under week eight on Blackboard so that you will be able to um, write your article. I also recommend that in this interview that you um, make, make some notes um, to help you because sometimes these, these class Zooms are very long and it may be tedious for you to go back through it. So taking some notes on, of your own might be a, a good idea. Um, in the assignment, you're gonna be using lots of quotes and you're gonna do some background information so you can write this A plus article that you're going to do in your midterm. <laughs> so, um, okay, so um, who, it's, who wants to start it off? Um, Jalen, do you want to start it off? With the question? Yeah, let's start um, off. Our, our oh, oh, so I personally want to say thank you guys for being here, Rich. Thank you for being here again. So this question, Mr. Ricky, uh, I do got a question just to start it off. Um, you know, with your nine-year tenure in the NFL, what you brought to the game, what was the most valuable lesson you learned while playing in the league of your nine years playing in the NFL? Oh, boy, I have to go back to the same thing I learned in high school. That, uh, nothing, nothing you can do will ever be being, being a person that's willing to work hard and do things that other people might not be willing to do to get to where you're trying to work. So, you know, I'm talking about working hard and being available to learn and, and as much and as fast as you can and to uh, be willing to make sacrifices that some people won't do to be, you know, to get to, to, get to that level. I, I mean, I can't tell you how many good football players I left back in high school and in college just, just didn't want to put in the time and the work uh, that was needed to get there, you know, and you got to be lucky to get there. Make no mistake about that. Right place at the right time, but hey, you got to be prepared when the opportunity presents itself, and that's true with anything. Okay. Well, um, and who else? Uh, Sean uh, Cameron, what's your? Yeah, I was Sean go first. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I got to pick the question. <clears throat> you want me to go? Uh, uh, Cameron, did you want to go or? I said I was passing it to Sean. I have to think of a question. Okay, Sean, go ahead. This is uh, Sean Blue. He's an excellent okay. um, news writer. Okay. Um, who were some of your favorite teammates that you played with? <clears throat> Uh, I, uh, I room, my roommate for four years was a guy that played for the Bears by the name of Walter Payton, uh, one of my favorite people in the whole world. Uh, my kindergarten person I went to kindergarten with, uh, uh, we went to Jackson State together, and he was just elected to the Hall of Fame, Robert Brazil. And, um, and then I'd say probably uh, after that, it would be a Jackie Slater, who was a good friend of mine, played with the Rams. So, um, but out of all of them, I would say probably Walter Payton was my closest and dearest friend. Wow. <laughs> I'm shook. Wow. Yeah. I have, sure. a, I have a question. Okay. I'm shook. Okay. So you just mentioned that you went to Jackson State. Um, so what is your opinion on the whole Deion Sanders being a heck football coach now at Jackson State? <laughs> I, I, um, I, I've been looking at that for the last uh, week uh, since he announced that. Uh, I was talking to, like I said, Robert Brazil is a good friend of mine who uh, lives in Jackson. So, and, uh, and, and it is tough to get a perspective on it. I, I don't know. I just, uh, I, I think it's a good move for, for the college and, uh, and hopefully he'll be a, 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 good, a good coach for a long time. But I, I, in a sense, I think it may be something leading, something in the, leading them back to Florida State. Maybe they told me they need some experience in coaching to get mm -hmm. to that level to the Division One. But still, in all this, it's going to do a lot of good things for the uh, uh, the black colleges. It's going to uh, allow some of the coaches to get some, you know, some. I would think some uh, two star, three star players back into black universities, and, and I'm looking forward to it. Hopefully, he'll be a good coach, and and uh, mm -hmm. and this will lead to some other guys coming back to to the, some of their schools and 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 giving something back. Okay, um, I have a question. So, with um, 
I've always wondered this. In the NFL, you have a lot of coaches and position coaches, head coaches. So what was your relationship like with your coach? And what I mean by that is, did you actually have like one-on-one conversation with your head coaches or were you mainly talking to like your offensive coordinator and your uh, position coach? You don't really have a lot of conversation with the head coach. I, I mean, I went hunting with him a couple of times, but that's about it. Good guy. But my offense coordinator lived about a half, less than a half mile from me. So we had a working relationship and we did have a personal relationship. As a matter of fact, I was just visited him uh, two days ago. So he is one of my, still one of my dearest friends. He just turned 93 and had a big birthday party for him. And he still talks a lot of smack and plays golf. So he's still in good health and he's still a good guy. So I, I, I my personal Best coach I've ever had was my offense coordinator that I played with under the Minnesota Vikings, Jerry Burns. Good guy from Michigan. He's a good man. Well, I got a question. So, yeah, I don't know if you watched today's game, but, like, what can you tell us the playing style of what it was back when you played versus the playing style of how the game has evolved now? When I started playing, uh, a guy by the name of Bill Walsh was my offense coordinator. And uh, we ran what they call a West Coast offense back then. And uh, you, you, you threw the ball short, got the ball out of the quarterback's hand, who was Dan Faust, was our quarterback. For the and uh, you, you, you threw the ball, you ran quick, short patterns, got the ball out of the quarterback hand, and you let the guys try to make the, make the most of it by, you know, just getting the ball in what they call a playmaker's hand. So it was uh, – it was simple. It wasn't very complicated. Uh, you get the ball to this guy, and he probably gonna turn a ten yard play into a fifty yard gain. So that's what they. That's the way we played back then. It was like short, quick releases, and wasn't a whole lot of strategizing. You block your guy, you block your guy, and we'll probably win this game. <laughs> hmm. And that's the way it was back then. But now it's, it seems like it's a lot of terminology, a lot of hand signals, and it's a lot of uh, I, what I'd say. And I don't mean this in a bad way. I don't think you have to go home and learn and study your playbook like we used to have to do. Like, Cause they could have anywhere from 2000 plays they can run on any given play now. That's all the plays now and you stick with it no matter what happened now. You don't have the audible like they used to have back then. The quarterback's not allowed that privilege to call their own plays and, and, and audible like they uh, used to do when I was playing at the time. I have a question. Was there a large, uh, back when you were in college, was there a large skill set difference between players that came out of HBCUs at the time and players that uh, came from PWIs, like regardless of race? Like, could you say that there was a distinct difference, whether it was good or bad, between, like like I said, players coming out of college from HBCUs and PWIs? I know back in, like, the 70s, 80s, a lot of um, um, prolific athletes came out of HBCUs, and a lot of people don't realize that now. Because a lot of people, um, or a lot of African Americans, I guess, go to the big money schools and they're uh, getting practically paid to go there. But we still have a lot of athletes, great athletes that came uh, at HBCUs. Like uh, obviously, for a good example, Darius Leonard, rookie of the year, defense rookie of the year, and people don't realize that he went to HBCU. So if I see some white person that says, "Oh, I'm a Colts fan," like, "Oh yeah, well, I went to college with Darius Leonard," like, "Really? Like, where do you go to college exactly?" So would you say there's a distinct? Um, like I guess skill set difference, or would you say they're pretty much equally balanced? Or did the HPCU players have an upper hand? Uh, I, you know what, when when you can play, you can play, man. It's just it's just a matter mm-hmm. of uh, getting the opportunity to, to show what you can do. Uh, you know, you you don't often see a, a black college on Saturdays on TV, and you don't, you know, like every Saturday or Monday or Wednesday nights and stuff. You, you have to go and witness it. You have to actually go to the stadium. And I think that's more the difference than anything else. It's like, it's like what you see and what's in front of you and what's on TV all the time. So um, I, like I told um, a couple of kids then, well, I want to go to this school. I want to go to school. Say, hey, if you can play, they'll find you. I don't care where you play. You can play on the rock by yourself. If you can play, they'll come find you. So it's just a matter of, you know, getting the recognition and the timing. And it was a cheap route for the, uh, like you talk about the old AFC. You now you look at half the guys that's going into the Hall of Fame now, are from black colleges, uh, and uh, and that's just the way it is. They're just starting to get some of the do and some of the things that they've deserved, rightly deserved, from a long time ago. But you look at the old AFC when it started up. That's where all of the seeming all the black uh, black black guys went to 
went to play at in the AFC, Oakland and the, uh, out in the AFC with Denver and, the, and teams like that, just starting up Kansas City. So that was the difference. That's the difference in, in, in what's now and what's then. It doesn't matter where you go. It's like, in the, and uh, you just see a lot of the exposure from the, what the guys get out of like Ohio State and Alabama. You look at Alabama, I guarantee you half those guys that play at Alabama would have been at Jackson State, Grambling, Southern, North Carolina State that you see now the plan uh, on Saturdays at Alabama and Ohio State. It's just a different change in vineyard in the television that you see them on. Well, uh, that brings me to a question uh, that we had discussed on the phone was about, um, you know, Black Lives Matters and how players, you know, um, you know, take a knee for Black Lives Matters. And, oh, he's here. He's here. Yay. Okay, good. Um, so I wanted to ask, hold on a second. Let Zafir get here. Let's, let's wait for him. He's here. I can introduce you. Zafir, hello. Are you here? Mm -hmm. Please turn on your camera. I want to introduce you. We're all bragging about you here. <laughs> <We're> <laughs> How <welcome>. are you? <laughs> This is Afir Kelly, and uh, we were just showing, uh, there's a great article about you in the Times uh, Democrat, and um, that you're, you know, uh, the good work that you've been doing. And so we're here with Ricky Young, uh, Minnesota Vikings, and uh, Rich Robinson, who was here last week. And this is your midterm, so you might want to take some notes. Um, but anyway, I'm just glad to uh, introduce you. And this is uh, Fear Kelly, guys. So. Pleasure to meet you, sir. Good to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you also. Um, so um, just as a fear, I was just telling you that Ricky Young, you played nine seasons and you had, um, let's see, that was Houston, right? San Diego Chargers. I'm sorry. San Diego Chargers for three years. San Diego Char Chargers and then the, the Minnesota Vikings. Yeah. And, and so anyway, you might want to have, did you come with some questions? Yeah, no. I'm glad you made, okay. Shoot. <laughs> oh, dang. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good oh, like one. One, my first one was like, how, how was it like adapting to the NFL speed? From college? Well, in college, you still had school and you had an excuse for sometimes being late or not playing real well. But once you get to professional level, there is no excuse. They pay you to be there, they pay you to play, and you better be ready to go when you get there. When you land on your feet, you better be ready to go because they don't, they don't wait for you. It's not like, well, we'll give them a chance. I don't know. Like they said, they give you the ticket to put you on the bus, and if you ain't ready, they throw you right off, man. <laughs> And uh, let's see, was it like just adapting like scheme wise from like college to the NFL is that faster? Yes, it is. It's a ton faster. It's like going like when you went from high school to college. Yeah. Or you know, from college to the pro. Every time you go up a little notch, it gets a little faster. They get a lot bigger and they run faster. So it's it's it's, it's, a, it's an adaptive that you got to do. But I mean, you, you still you got to be smart. You got to. Like I said, work hard and prepare and uh, like your life depends on it and, and be ready when your opportunity presents itself. And for I, I'd say 90% of the time, they don't care who you are, what school you went to, what color you are, if you can play and, you, and you're willing to, you know, like do the thing that they ask you to do, you'd be fine. Definitely. So like, from your perspective, like was it easy for you when you first got into the league? No, it wasn't that easy. Let me tell you, I got to be honest with you. It was, uh, it was, uh, it, 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 things have changed quite a bit now. We, we had coaches and coordinators that went to, uh, like the University of Texas that really wasn't that keen on, on certain guys, certain schools they went to or whatever. And it was a little bit of prejudice. I got to admit that. But, uh, you know, you, you work through those things and people get to know you and they change. And it's like, you, you can't believe how many people tell you that, hey, you know what, I had, I had a tone, I just, I had this tone of deafness and I just believed that this was it and this is the way you had to do it. And I had to have a guy from this school and he goes, I was wrong. I had a couple of coaches tell me that. So it's like, you know, like I said, you, you work hard and you, and you keep yourself in the straight and narrow and uh, people respect you for that. And I, you'll always come out, you know, pretty much close to the top. 
Definitely. Anything you do, that's it. That's in the grades and stuff like that. People usually will always go back and adjust. And there is some, I, I shouldn't say this, asses that out there that don't, you know, <laughs> that won't change, refuse to change. But yeah. you got to be above those people, man. You got to get through, through hard work. You'll, you'll, it'll, it'll work out for you. Um, what's my uh, was it like, what was easier, staying in the league or like trying to make it in the league? Staying. <laughs> every day, man, every year they got somebody coming looking for the job and they get, they get hungry and hungry and hungry. So that's why you got to stay up and, 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 and stay on top of yourself and, and make sure you don't uh, start to sell and think and start reading your press clip and telling everybody how good you are and thinking how good you are and not preparing because people come and they come hungry and they don't stop coming. So it's, it's tough for the state and it is to actually make it in the league. It's, it's, just, it's really tough to stay at that level. Yeah, that's, what, that's what I was told before. I was just really curious if like that was true because so many people oh, yeah. say, like, staying in the league way harder than making it in the league. Well, you can look at that at your school. You go to college, man. They always got these kids coming in with these press clippings. I remember I got telling them, I don't know if you were here, but I was telling uh, a young lady that I, she said, who was that? Who was my closest friend in college? I told her I played with Walter Payton. And, and the whole the whole jazz that is like, uh, we had a Wilbur Montgomery, I don't know if you know, played with the Eagles coming to that school. And he was like, uh, I mean, he played with the Eagles for like 10 or 12 years. He's, he's a great player. And uh, I coach said, listen, you guys got to leave one day. He says, I want to have this kid room with you guys. So y'all keep him here, teach him how to play and teach him how to do this and do that. And when you guys leave, he'll have two years to pick up after you. And when you can play that, come find you. Somebody from Abilene Christian flew somebody up there and snuck him out of the, uh, got him out of the campus and took him down there. And he made, he was an all American for two years in, in, high, uh, in college at uh, Abilene Christian. So it's, 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 it's true what they say, you know, you, it's hard to stay at that level, man. Hard to keep it, keep I it going. Yeah, my last question was like, when you got, when you switched from one team to the other, was it, was it like the same type of scheme or you had to learn a whole different defense? I don't know. We had to learn a whole new terminology, a whole new different thing. That's why it's so good if you can stay with the same team, you know, because football is, you you know, you play. It's like reaction. It's like you don't have time to think. You're thinking and boom, the play is over. They're already gone. It's, it's past you. Somebody threw an out and up on you. If you had to think about it, once you know, you get the terminology and the gist of how they want you to play it. And you can just react. It's like two-tenths of a second of reaction time. And it's, that's how fast they, they go. So if you, you can stay with the same team, keep the same terminology and, and stay with the same, like I said, through it, say working for the same company, just to know who and what you got to do every day, day in and day out, life gets a little easier for you. But when you got to learn a whole new system, it kind of bogs you down a little bit, but Hey, if that's what you want to do, you will figure it out. I promise you. Um, I wanted to elaborate back on the whole, um, how you saying that it's a lot of uh, HBCU players getting inducted into the NFL Hall of Fame. Yes. Um, Johnny Shell will be inducted coming up, and he's an alumni of South Carolina State University. I played against that. I know he is. Steelers guy, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and um, I recently learned that the Steelers organization um, actually had the most drafted uh, HBCU players at 28. And yeah. I was just wanted to I wanted to ask you, um, why do you think that like it has changed so much in the way of now you may get two or three HBCU players. And it's not that I personally don't think the talent is gone. Like I still think HBCUs have some of the best talent, but like, why do you think that like it has completely changed from them doing like, you know, constantly bringing the HBCU players to now is not, it's not as many. Well, you go back and, and you don't have to go back that far. Um, money, television. And uh, when I went to school, I had a call from a guy named, by the name of Bear Brown, who was a coach at Alabama. And it's just, I'm sure, a courtesy call because uh, at that time they said, well, we, we don't know if we can bring you up here now at this time, Ricky, but we, we like to, but uh, I don't know if we can. So that's the part in times that, you know, that that's changed quite a bit now. Like I was just saying about the, the, if you look at Alabama and all the kids they got there, you look at that defense, they might have one guy white playing on the defense and everybody's from Alabama, or Georgia, Mississippi, Southern kids around in that area. So 
it's, it's, it's changed in the sense that it's television. They promise and they get these kids on television and that's what they want to do. And they're looking at who, how, how they can get them drafted and they talk to the parents. They don't talk to them about going to school and being a good citizen. They talk about how much money you can make if you come to school here. I can get you drafted in the top 10 and you're guaranteed $20 million to be drafted. And, uh, and, and that, that people, uh, a lot of the players now kind of uh, banking on that. And they are good players. I, I, you just have to watch. You sit down and watch the TV on Saturday and you count to me how many wide receivers they got playing that it's not uh, black kids. You look at the Southern and the running backs and the skill positions. And, and now they finally started to let them play quarterback. So it's pretty soon going to be a whole different deal here. And uh, I, I, that's the reason why that's not so many black kids kept being drafted. It's not that they don't have the talent there. They just, they, they're they gonna go to the schools, the bigger schools now and, and look through all they got and they wanna come back to the, because you don't have the publicity. The black kids don't get the publicity. So what they're stuck with is like, they come over and they still, is, they still here for nothing. And then they wanna play like Ladarius, you're talking about the, and the linebacker. He should have been a first round pick, but he wasn't because they said, well, we don't know he hadn't played against the big schools yet. If you can play, you can play. <laughs> I mean, he, played against, use. he played against Clemson and had 18 tackles. So I didn't know, I don't know what more they needed to prove that he wasn't go, he was gonna be great at the next level. But I, it's just just a matter of it's uh, money. It's money, money. If they can get you cheaper, that's what they're gonna do. And that's what and that's what they really do, you know. If you and it's not that you don't have a good agent, you can't play. It's just that they just, they know how cheap they can get. So, well, you didn't play in that, that level. I don't know. I didn't see you play every Saturday, so I don't know what you can do. But that's BS. They know what you can do. It's just a, it's a money-saving adventure for them more than anything else. Um, did you ever experience the playoffs, the postseason? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, we went to the – I was at the six years I was with the Vikings, I think, with the playoffs – Five years and we went to the championship game once. And before I got here, they just that was the last time they played in the Super Bowl, 75. And when I left San Diego, so I just think it was just the ghost father. I left San Diego and then they went to the Super Bowl and I got to the Viking, they just went to the Super Bowl. So I missed them two times by a year. So <laughs> and when they say it's being in the right place at the right times, because I did have a friend that played with the Steelers, was one with the three Super Bowls and he, all he did was cover kickoff. So it says like you gotta be in the right place at the right time. So it's uh, like anything else here, it's uh, timing, a lot of it is time. Rich, what well, do you have a good question for Ricky that you would ask him? Uh, not yet. <laughs> okay. I, was, not um, I have a question. Oh, sorry. Um, how was life after playing? Like, how was the transition from playing professional football, from playing football all your life, and then going outside of it and getting into the career field? Uh, and that, that's tough. I mean, you know, it's very seldom do you leave a game because you played it from, uh, let's say, fifth, sixth grade all through, and you just – and it's not that you don't prepare for the end. It's just that you don't want to see it come to an end. And it's like a lot of people didn't, don't prepare for that. I, fortunate enough, I, in my sixth and seventh year, I started looking into some other things. And I went to a um, minority-owned project uh, plan through Ford Motor Company to buy a car dealership. And uh, I was fortunate enough to go through that program and pass through that. And um, I think it was like uh, two years after I uh, was done playing, I was fortunate enough to buy and to and own a car dealership for 14 years until my youngest son graduated from the University of Hawaii. And then I thought, okay, I can do that and, and uh, sell this thing now and retire. <laughs> but I was very fortunate enough that I had some people with me and uh, was uh, helping me along the ways uh, throughout my football playing career. And who was advising me, my attorney, uh, was he owned car dealerships and he was uh, pretty instrumental in helping me land that job shortly after I was done playing. So, but it's a tough transition. It's, it's like anything else. I mean, when you leave, when you leave college, it's going to be a tough transition. Even if you get a, a, a job that you really want and cherish really bad, it's just the change. And, you know, sometimes change is tough, but it is good. Um, I do have 
do you do still do anything with with the the Vikings um, in, in the organization? Yes, they have us. We do. Oh God, we do a lot of charitable stuff. They ask us to go out in the, in the community. Some of a lot of the uh, alumni, and we have the biggest alumni if you can believe this of anybody in the NFL. Just players that still living around Minnesota, and God knows why. And most of them are from Texas, Alabama, like myself, and California. <laughs> and they do. They have a a great. The, the ownership here is really, really good about helping and doing a lot of things for the alumni and. Uh, invite us to everything that they have there. They got a suite for an alumni guys to go to for every game or any game you want to go to. And, uh, and they have us go out and do stuff out in the community. And, uh, uh, and a lot of the people around there still understand, they still like the way things used to be. And they don't, I mean, changes are good, but they like the old guys that come out and hang out in the community and do stuff and go around town and, and go play golf with some people that you don't know and hang out with them and, and, and do things that uh, to help kids out of it. Like, touch football and raise money for different things. So uh, we do a lot of stuff around it. And the Vikings are, 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 like I said, an excellent team. And they do a lot of good stuff to help us out, to, to keep us uh, motivated and keep us doing things in the community. Did you get a chance? Did you get a chance to play uh, South Carolina State in college? I don't know how, uh, what, how, I don't know what your conference was back in the day because I know it always ends up changing. But did you ever get a chance um, to play them? We were in the, we were in the SWAC. Let's see. Us, Grambling, okay. Texas Southern, Southern, Grambling, Alcorn, and Mississippi Valley State. And, no, I never played South Carolina State. I played with a couple of guys that went there here in mm -hmm. Minnesota. And I talk a lot of smack with them. We just smack them up. But... So, What's that? <laughs> I'll share a picture there, photo. Oh, you should do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, that was it. Uh, it says you were a record breaker. Um, the most, uh, oh gosh, I've got this thing kind of small here. Most, um, what is it, rap? Running back. Okay, running back season. Most, <laughs> the, most, most receptions, receptions running back. back. This is running back season. I could yeah. do the typo, yeah. 1978, yeah, that was the year I got here, yeah. Led the league in pass receiving. And it's, it's just so amazing. I got to tell you this story. You talk about a, a small black colleges. Um, they have a, a banquet in Washington, D.C. the year I led the league in receiving. And Walter had led the league in rushing. And Robert Brazil was uh, the defensive player of the year. So three players from one school asked, you know, Small black colleges, and we were all uh, won awards that one year. And uh, and I bet you nobody ever said a word about it. I just it dawned on me like about five or six years afterwards. That's like you know, I was just happy to be back there with them, and we did have a good time in Washington. But um, it, it's just it, it kind of tells you, like I just said earlier, um, it's so many of those guys now are going into the Hall of Fame, and that's just like it, it's taken probably about 20 years longer than it should have been, but at least it's still happening now. So I, I'm on, I've been back there about five times in the last, to the Canton to, uh, with people I know and I went to school with or played against that's finally getting their due and, and, and being honored into the Hall of Fame. So it, it, sometimes it takes a little longer than you want it to, man, but that's just the way life is. You just prepare and do the best you can do and be as good at whatever it is you do. And don't let nobody deter you and tell you you can't do something because if you want to do it, I guarantee you, you'll find a way to get it done. And that's, I swear to you, I believe in that and I instill that in my two boys. Like nobody can take anything away from me. If you work hard and you're willing to do what some people won't do to get where you're trying to go to, I mean, you don't have to lie, cheat, tell somebody to do something you can't do. You be honorable and work hard. People will reach out and help you out. Uh I got a question. Um, as far as endorsements, did you get any like commercial deals or anything in that aspect? Well, it wasn't a whole lot of people getting commercial deals. Now I name them probably on two. <laughs> Back then, mm -hmm. uh, Walter Payton, Earl Campbell. Let me see who else. Let's see. As far as majority guys, it wasn't a lot of. I don't, um, Black guys getting a lot of endorsements back then, and I, and I don't I don't mean that being derogatory. I wasn't a lot of endorsements, period. But you know, yeah, like yeah. no name it. Then it was a couple of guys, like four or five guys that got all endorsements, and maybe one or two, two or three black guys, and that was about it. I had a shoe deal with Nike that I got uh, shoes. They paid me 
$4,500 a year and gave me shoes and as much naked stuff as I could take out of that or out of a magazine, which was good. I got everybody I knew as much stuff. <laughs> so <laughs> out of that, I probably was probably got paid somewhere probably close to like you know, $12,000 a year, which back then would have been a lot of money. So it's changed dramatically over the years. So I have, I have a question for you, Ricky. Okay. Um, well, one, you were here during the, uh, the Les Steckle days. Oh, that was my last year, man. I couldn't do that. I couldn't stand Les Steckle. I, that's what I, <laughs> maybe it drove me to quit. He drove a lot of people to oh, yeah. stand on the ledge that year. Oh, yeah, he did. Oh, yeah. But um, one of the questions I had, because back then when you were playing, um, there wasn't free agency. No. So these guys today, you know, are getting that guaranteed upfront money, which I mean, you got to be scratching your head now because, like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> I would have played one year. <laughs> yeah, that's all you would have needed. That's all I needed. They gave me my ten million dollars in one year, and I'm out. I am done. But right. yeah, it's uh, it's it's kind of crazy. So if you had the option back then. Would you have um, let your contract expire and choose to some, go somewhere else, stay out on the West Coast where it's warmer, or actually choose to come to Minnesota? Well, I, and that's a, that's a tough question. I, I, I'm going to be honest with the first part. Now, if I could choose to let it expire, I would let it expire, not because I had to go from the West Coast, from, from the West Coast to Minnesota, just because of the money, man. It's like, you know, you, you have a pretty good year and you're a free agent. It's like, oh, it's skated by the doors. It's like, hey, get back up the brink trucks and let's load it up and I'm going to go. <laughs> but and when I was playing, when you couldn't change teams, it's like, you know what, they would punish you. And that, that was what won anything else because I stayed out of camp because they wouldn't pay me. They promised me every year. Like I go back to telling you from the small black colleges, they didn't, they said, well, listen, we don't know anything about you, but if you come out and play, we'll renegotiate your contract. Okay, so you sign a three-year deal, and they're like, well, we can't this year, but next year we'll get you. And next year, I'm like, no, I'll be done playing by the time this sits this, this, this over. So I decided I wasn't going to camp, and they traded me to the Vikings because they know it's cold up there. And the year after that, they sent John Jefferson out to Green Bay. And That's right. Like, punishment so and, and it worked out so great for me here man I had Bud Grant here who was a steady force here and it was no change and you do it my way and you don't have to worry about what the press say what the fans say you just do what I tell you to do and I run the team so and, and that's the way it was run back here with that and that was and San Diego wasn't like that they were they, you know you in San Diego and the people uh they don't they're not from San Diego everybody come from other parts of the country and they got their own team mm -hmm. to root for and they didn't care about the charges. All they cared about is seeing their team when they came to town because people retire. That's where they go. You just go to San Diego. So it's kind of like Phoenix. You know, nobody's from there. Everybody's there. Yeah. Nobody's from there. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, hey, they just wait for their teams to come back out to town, more or less. So I, I would have chill. If I would have known how good it was going to be in Minnesota, I definitely would have changed. That's why I'm still here. That's why a lot of them are here. It's always about people, man. I don't care what you do, where you go. It's always about the people. Yeah, I still chat with a lot of your old buddies. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. And they ain't leaving. No, no, no. They're doing good around here. They treat you pretty good. If you, like I said, if you work hard, people reach out and help you out. Yep. Oh, so, were you, when you came in to Minnesota, were you, say, like every down back or third down back or specialty back? Oh, man. I played every down and I was on two special teams. So, yeah, you wasn't no. Hey, can you play? You know, I, I only reason I got to play at Jackson State, I learned how to block. I had to block for Walter. So, you know, when you get to the pros, <laughs> you got to be able to block and pick that's up blocks. Well, that aided me more than anything else. That's who I blocked for. And I learned I had to block. That's only I got on the field. And when he went out, I got to run the ball. So I was fortunate enough to play for a coach that taught me that. Hey, hey man, when they, when you got the ball, you know, there's 12 people looking for you. So when you block for somebody, all of you got to block your guy and you get out the field, less likely you're going to get hurt. <laughs> And I think, kind of took that to heart. So, it's, yeah, I mean, like I said, I caught a lot of passes out of the backfield. I did out of the Bill Walsh and Jerry Burns both. You know, it's like, hey, let's do this. We'll get with third and two, third and four. That's my deal, man. I can run whatever one of my playbook. If I got third and four, third and six, I'm, I'm good. So that's what we did. We did a lot of simple things, and but we worked it out. Um, Very nice. 
Um, I have a question. So into as a as a person watching the NFL right now, if you can choose any head coach for you, like if in your younger days and based off the coaches now, if you could um, be a running back in anybody's system, which um, head coach would you choose? Oh boy, I I I, I don't like him because he always wins. But I choose Bill Belichick. <laughs> 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 you guys win. You win, man. You win. You win. That's the whole deal, man. You, you want to win when you're playing. It's nothing like winning. It's, it's, a, it's a great sport, and you, and it's it's terrible when you don't lose because you got to wait a week. It's not like baseball or basketball. You play every day, every night. Sometimes you got to wait a whole week. So, and you only got you know when I was playing, it was 14 games to win, and, and it's it's just tough. And it's like it's so many people that have to do their job on every play to make it work. You talk about. Uh, was well, like you know that a, a team sport. It's, it's nothing, nothing better than that to go out and you got however many guys on the team, eleven out there on the field with you, and everybody does their job, and you win a football game. It's so rewarding, and, it, and it's uh, it just carries on through all, all, all other things you do in your lifetime. It's like to appreciate other people and the things that they have to go through to be where they're at, and that puts you eye to eye with them, no better, no less, and it's just preparing yourself and saying, hey. He can do it. I can do it. I'm gonna do it. Uh, we're so Daryl. We're kind of running down on time. Do you have some questions? Um, who was your biggest rival in the NFL? The Green Bay Packers. <laughs> hated them. Still hate them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> uh, the one team I dreamed of playing for was the Raiders, and they almost became a charges are my worst nightmare. I hated those guys for a while. But uh, that's the team I dream of playing for was the Oakland Raiders. And then I went to the Chargers. I got close though to my dream team, but it's probably like 180 miles apart. But uh, that was the team I always wanted to play for. Didn't get to play for, which was okay. But uh, the Packers, I, I hate, I still hate those guys. Why? Because uh, it was such a rivalry. I mean, I say hate, I mean, I don't, hate and hope something happens to them. I would never try to hurt them or do anything differently from them. They had, they had really good fans and they, they appreciate the game and they just, uh, they, they always play hard. And sometimes I think they, they win when they're not supposed to win. And that bugs me sometimes. <laughs> so how do you feel about Aaron Rodgers being considered a top five quarterback in today's league? As a player, you always give a player his due, man. I'm telling you, I think he's in probably in the top three, or yes, me, but I tell you, <laughs> he can throw the football, and that's what he gets paid to do. And I mean, he can throw it as good as anybody. That's a fact. <laughs> and well, I, you know, I hope he does well. I have a, a question and a, and a shot. Um, you're talking about coaching. How would you feel, you know? Um, about Belichick. Belichick finds ways to win, to close out games. Yes. Watching Atlanta play. Oh, that's terrible. I mean, we, the Vikings are 0 3. And I tell you what, I take our 0 3 over Atlanta's 0 3. I'm telling you, that would drive me. I'm telling you, I missed the best. Yeah, I couldn't do that deal, boy. Wow, <laughs> I, 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 I'm just saying. So you, you want to play with the, you want to play with the coach who knows how to win games and close yeah. games out. Yeah, and every week, a particular team, which happened to lose to the Patriots, oh, uh, and this guy is still on the payroll. <laughs> it's, you know, same same with uh, Doc Rivers. So, yeah. I mean, oh, you got it right, man. I mean, you these... get this... <laughs> <laughs> wow, yeah, I was looking at that too last week. Doc Rivers, like, I, I love Doc. I'm like, oh man, how could you lose that game? But hey, <laughs> <laughs> right. And so, and so, as a as a fan, as a um, owner, because you've paid out so much money to go after this coach to get this coach, yeah. But he can't get past. He can't do it. 
Yep. He just can't do it. Sean, you're literally on mute. <laughs> Sean is. <laughs> Sean, you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> One of the worst games I ever watched in my entire life was that Super Bowl when they lost to Dallas. He just tried to outthink the situation. I'm like, just play the game, play the game man. He's just trying to outthink, make sure Belichick can pull something off on him. 28 to 3. Right. <laughs> Come back and play them as a player. If I lost the Super Bowl, if you up 28 to 3 and you lose that game, that's shot. That just that would just rip my heart out almost. I mean, the Super Bowl, the other games. I, as terrible as it is, but that Super Bowl game was the worst thing. I just I stopped watching football for a, a couple of weeks when it came back the next day. It was just devastating to me. How could he lose that, that game? Was, mm. I think it was rigged. But that was the last. Oh, game. here you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, give me another. Trump says rigged. <laughs> That's what he yeah, said. I think it was rigged. No, oh, Mr. Rich, I've got a question for you. Hey, let me ask you this. Would, let me ask you this. Would you think that Seattle loss was rigged too? Yes. Well, they, I throw a pass. Yes. Yeah, oh, was, yeah, for sure. Like, if you that take, one was rigged. Was like, all, all the offensive linemen. Offense, that wasn't, no. Just hand, what's the name of that ball? What's the running back they had that? Marshawn Lynch. Marshawn Lynch. 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 Just to sit in the corner, but hand him that ball, I guarantee he'll score a touchdown. What but, a, exactly. but, but I don't, I don't, I'm not mad at that call because if you go back and look at it, Marshawn Lynch was 0 4 from at the one yard line. So <laughs> they were already kind of like, uh, and then if you look at the pat the passing game that, that Russell Wilson had that game, he was on fire. So I understand the call, but I still would rather just take the chance of him not getting in as opposed to turning over the ball. That was first down, down though. Down, though. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Down. That's why, so but, that's why that's why I say like I understand the call, but you had four tries. So I'm not I'm passing the ball on first down and goal. Uh, I mean, when you got a nice bat like Marshawn, I would have ran that ball in on the one yard line. I mean, you got to dance with the guy. You got to dance that's with the person that bought it to the party, baby. That's it, <laughs> man. He bought it to the party. So he bought to the party. I'm going with him. I don't care. I'm going down with the ship with what I know. I my best shot is. Now I, I don't Broncos, like it. Now the, the Broncos and Panthers was rigged. Super Bowl Fifty was rigged. Yeah, that was rigged. Was rigged. That was rigged. That, that was rigged. That was rigged. Wait, which one was rigged? Way closer than what people uh, the, the Broncos and Panthers. The Denver Broncos. That was Cam, Manning's Cam, last Cam, game. It was it was all the defeated team. They knocked the ball and he would have been over to pick it up. That should have dove on the ball. That's heartless, right? <laughs> he went to that, he literally went to go grab the ball and then he backed up. Like, I'm not supposed to touch this ball. That's how I knew it was rigged. It just and that's what they teach you though. No. Rigged. I'm telling you, I've never seen what bigger game you got to play in. If you're gonna get hurt, you gotta go down to the Super Bowl. What, what the hell would you plan for if you didn't have to play to win that one? <laughs> I, I, I didn't I didn't I'm expect old. it. <laughs> I was at work when it happened. Um when they was uh I think there was Sean, they was uh what 30 what? I forgot the score, but they was up by like ten with like five minutes left, and then what game you talking about? Home and they Wait, what game are you talking about? Yeah, what game? I'm talking about the uh, Falcons and the Bears yesterday. Oh, oh, right. oh. Yeah. Talking are we still talking about that? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I, I, I have a, um, a question and another uh, upside for Atlanta. There's back no in that, well, this is a props. <laughs> this is a props to Atlanta. I'm gonna go back a few years. You might not have been born, but this goes back a few years. 1998, uh, Minnesota Vikings, oh, best offense yeah. in the league, best offense, were running people one. out of town. Fifteen and one. Fifteen and one had home field advantage throughout the playoffs. <laughs> um, Atlanta comes into town. Uh, I had the privilege of working that game, and. As Atlanta's coming down the tunnel, I'm right behind a couple of the players, and they were talking about how the receivers from the Minnesota Vikings are punks. He said, by the time this is over, those guys are going to be coming by to wash my car, take my laundry. I said, wow, hmm. okay, this this is serious. And, uh, uh, God, what the heck is the boxer's name um, back then? Bit the ear off. Oh, oh, um, Tyson, oh Mike, Tyson. Mike, Tyson. Mike Tyson. He was there from Atlanta. He was up here for a bowling tournament. His son played at the University of Georgia. Holyfield. Holyfield. Oh, Holyfield. Yeah. Yeah. Evander, yeah. Evander Holyfield. Yeah. Well, Holyfield was down there talking trash, too. Oh, yeah. He's Atlanta. Yeah. He, he's talking big trash. So I said, oh, oh. You know, Chris Carter was 
talking his normal stuff. And so um, I believe Minnesota was a 14 point favorite that oh, game. At least, at least, at least. Yeah. yeah, at least 14 point favorite. And it was just by the end of the game, actually, I ran back upstairs, made a phone call and said, hey, put some cheese down in Atlanta because this game's going to be tight. Yeah. <laughs> off, you know, off the side. But anyways, yeah. <laughs> so you could feel the game changing. You could feel, literally feel the game changing. And Atlanta was, the dirty bird was all over the place. Atlanta fans are going crazy. And by the time that game was over, Atlanta had just left that 65,000 people. It was like a funeral. It was like yeah. a you could, yeah. It was a sound in the stadium. I was in Red McCombs' box when that kid missed. Oh, that to me and said, Ricky, you know how to get people down on the field to that. It's later. What's it? Robin Robinson. Uh, you know how to get people down there. They, they pass out those hats. You know, they stick those championship hats on this on his hats and give them to people. Yep. My yep. Sister has a that they give up. That could cost me about, about, about $80,000 in cash because I had Super Bowl tickets. The guy said, like, well, they were selling me the tickets. I had a friend that was buying them. He's a big travel agency guy out of New York, and he was buying them for me for like three Gs a piece. And I was just paying the regular price for them back then, which was 150 bucks or something. Yeah. I went home, I cried for about three days. <laughs> <laughs> well, so that was my experience with that game. It was like a funeral. Oh. Oh, it was a, yeah, it was bad. And and people are still, just like you say with Atlanta, wondering what happened. They're yeah. still like that here in Minnesota. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's like you don't have a, I just like, it can't be over with, can it? You know, we're 15 and one. We're going to the Super Bowl. They already had us picked, us heading to the Super Bowl. I had tickets, flights, hotels, and everything. I'm like, oh, man. Same here. Had a nice condo rented down to Miami. That's it. Oh, well. So, uh, so, you know, there's one kudos for Atlanta. Yeah, <laughs> they did. They did come through. They did go. You're right. They did go. They went. They went. They don't help them now, though. They ain't helping them at all now. No, sir. Uh, <laughs> sorry, we're taking over your deal. Okay. It's okay. It's okay. No, I just want to make sure everybody's able to ask their questions so that you're going to be able to write a really strong um, article. Um, oh yeah. yeah. Oh, if not, give them my cell number. They can call me. I don't care. <laughs> word? Your word? You ain't answering. You ain't answering that phone. I'll get it. I'll answer my phone. Ask. I'll answer my phone. You can text me. I'll answer. Um. Well, let's see. Okay. Well, I'm gonna. I'm gonna ask a Barbara Waltery kind of question. All right. Go ahead. So, I don't even have to answer it though. <laughs> All right, go ahead, babe. I'm sorry. Oh, no, don't cry. Don't cry. Don't make me cry here. I did. No, I'm just, you know, um, you know, you just hear, you know, there's a lot of uh, play, like, uh, who would be a good example? The one, the basketball player. You know, there's a lot of uh, problems with sometimes ball players get in trouble with, you know, women and alcohol and mm -hmm. drugs and getting all crazy and stuff. What are your thoughts on that? I told I you know you you got to believe me when I tell you this now. I'm 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 kind of somewhat crazy sometimes. I wrote a letter to um, Roger Goodell when these guys get in trouble for beating up the girlfriend and stuff. I said you should should have hired my grandmother. I guarantee you she'd get that shit straight away. <laughs> 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 you ever hit a woman? I will not only disown you. I will beat your that you don't ever pick up, don't ever put, they said, get in your car. If you get married or a girlfriend, go get in your car, run, drive, get away. Don't ever, don't you ever hit a woman. And uh, if you get caught for still not being able to work and you go to jail for drugs and stuff, she says, I wouldn't even bother to come see you. You know, life is short. You do what you're supposed to do. And if that's what you decide to do, it's on you. You go and you suffer the consequences. And you shouldn't ever, 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 ever hit a woman. And I think like I said, I that's never been a problem for me ever. I would never do that to anybody's mom, sister, daughter, because if somebody did it to my mom, my sister, my daughter, I know how I'd feel and I know what I want to do to them. So that's, that's not, and I got my two boys and I, they get the same speech that I gave them. So that I got when I was growing up. So. So do you have any advice for like players coming into the league and um, like just 
advice on how to conduct yourself and you know how to stay out of out of trouble and just be a good player and a good role model to so many people under you oh you do things that you think your mom's right in the next room watching you most of the time and that'll that should get you doing what you're supposed to do it's like you know life is so short you treat people like you want to be treated and usually it, it works out for everybody and and uh some of the things you, you think nobody's doing or you shouldn't do in the dark they always come to the light so you know what just don't try and fool yourself man you're not as smart as anybody else at all it's always going to come back to you man and uh and you, and you treat yourself like like a gentleman and conduct yourself like a person that Hey, you know what I what I do here? I'd go out and do it at somebody else's house. I'm not gonna be any different. I'm not gonna hide behind. I'm a big time football player. And I can do what I want to do, and do whoever I want to do it to it. I can get out of trouble with it. It's just that it's not gonna happen. Hey Rick, I have a question for you. Um, since I'm a Kansas guy, Gail Sayers, oh. what do you think? Of I got to meet Gail about five or six different times through Walter when I was back there and stuff. You talk about a good man. Oh, absolutely. He was one of the best people. I, and I'm not BSing. I, I've ever met, I had the opportunity to meet in my life. And not just because he was one of the best football players I ever put on a pair of shoes and a helmet. It was just uh, a delight to meet him, talk to him, get to know him. And, uh, and just a true, true, true professional guy, man. Just, down to earth as you'd ever meet as, I mean, a superstar like he was. And I mean, just a gentleman. Yeah. Yeah. What a, what a loss. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a tragic death in the KU nation. Yeah. I bet. That's like, I was got a good friend that she works over. She's a manager's a, a little pub over here and she's, Kansas, Kansas basketball, and then I went over there to see her, and she wasn't there. So, and she, I don't think she knows Gail, but she's all about Kansas. So she probably went back there or something. I don't know what she did. I had nobody said she just didn't come into work. So, but, yeah, well, that's a great loss for that state and for the NFL. And for the NFL, yeah. Who would you compare? Since you, you know, you hung out with Walter, Barry Sanders. Barry Sanders. <laughs> 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 wow. me to go see I don't care what they'd be at playing against who they could be playing against 40 people by themselves I'd still pay to go see them play yeah Barry Sanders Gail Sears and Walter I mean but that Walter was just he he worked and worked and worked and worked he had to do a lot of stuff that they did but a little bit more when he was playing but those guys were so smooth and so quick and so everything yeah Sanders huh yeah not a doubt. Yeah, he was he was something else. I had the pleasure of uh, watching watching him play when you know Detroit was yeah. playing against Minnesota all the time. So I get to see him play once a year. It, breathless. Oh, it's to be funny. You hear the defensive guy say, "Stay over there. I got him. I got him. I got him." They said, "Which way to go? Where to go? Where to go?" <laughs> <laughs> on the sideline sometimes that's the only game I wanted to be on the sideline when he was playing because big guys couldn't find him half the time <laughs> couldn't touch him couldn't touch I got, him I got another question um, what was the biggest hit you took in, in your career <laughs> oh god we were, if you're talking about Dinah Shell, we were playing the Steelers and uh, I remember jumping up over the, I was with the Chargers going across the middle and had to jump up for a pass and uh, not Mel Blunt uh, oh was the other quarterback named Wagner, I think. He hit me right in the back of the legs, and I remember flipping over like two or three times, and I thought, oh, man, I'm going to be dead by the time I hit this ground. I would say, I'll never be dead. <laughs> I just been, I hit the ground and landed on the ball on my stomach, and uh, I did think I was dead for about a, 10 seconds, but uh, that's probably the worst that I ever had, <laughs> ever had to deal with. It was against the Steelers. That was after they won the Super Bowl in 75, so they had a great team. God, they had a great team. Do you feel that the league has become softer, almost leaning towards flag football, especially with quarterbacks? Oh, it's like, and that's why so many people get hurt so much. When I was playing football, when I first started, we go to training camp. The first day we were there, we 
put the ball in the five yard line, you had to score a touchdown. If you didn't score, you had to run two laps and everybody on offense. And that's what we did for 30 days. Now they have training camp for nine days. And the players, you can't tell the players from the coaches, the real players, nobody's on the field except the, the kids trying to make the team now, the low round draft picks and stuff. It's all yeah, the, exactly. The first team guys don't touch each other, don't tackle. That's why you see them all just going down like, like flies now because they don't, they just don't, they haven't built up their bodies to that contact yet. And that's going to take another three weeks, you know, people before people stop getting hurt because they don't practice anymore. They just stand around with their hats on backwards and laugh and get <laughs> other guys out there getting the practice. That's why, that's why a lot of these guys that nobody's ever heard of playing so much now. Right. <laughs> they're ready to go, man. They don't want to tackle and get tackled. So, yeah, they're ready to go. But these other guys, the superstars, like, well, yeah, we didn't practice today. No, they won't have any contact with them. Like, I could have played another 10 years where they go. I hate the whole thing I hate about football was training camp. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, everybody hates training camp, no matter where yeah. or what. Yeah, you tackle every day down in Mankato when I was there. Well, they still would have, except with, you know, with the new owners up here now, it's yeah. Ziggyville. Well, yeah, nobody wants to tie. They don't, that's their, their investment now. And now you can see it. You know, you're paying a guy ten million, twelve million dollars. You don't want to see him go down at, at, at practice. <laughs> you still got to pay no, you him don't. $1 million dollars too. So yeah, that's an investment. Yeah, uh, that's like true. Thirty-seven thousand dollars. That wasn't an investment. That was a, a small loan. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, for my class, I just want to make sure: Are you looking down at all your questions? Have you been able to ask all your questions? That's on your ten question list. <laughs> Anybody have anything left? Um, who do you, okay, so like who do you think now is the like the best quarterback in the league? Like, because you done been in the league and you didn't seen the evolution of quarterbacks. Yeah. So like who do you think right now, just this season, is the best quarterback you've you've seen so far? What are you talking about this season right now? Yeah, in these past oh, three games. Seattle. So what's the my guy from Seattle? Yes, he's so, the best right now. I mean, Mahomes, and you got the what's the name? The kid from the Baltimore Ravens and Lamar. Lamar but if you talk of statistics right now, that's mm -hmm. the guy from Seattle. Okay, and my, my last question. I'm sorry. Um, but how do you? Okay, so like Russell Wilson has probably never had like a legit good offensive line, but yeah, he has. He has. Um, he has more wins than losses. He's he has 84 wins in eight seasons, but he has yet to have an NFL MVP vote. Um, and he hasn't missed the playoffs. So, like, how why do you think that is? I, I'm telling you, what the year that they won the Super Bowl, I thought he should have been the MVP. I don't. What did the guy tell me? Somebody told me he's never even received a vote for an MVP. Yeah, he's never gotten. That's, that's insane. That is insane. This is the most. He is probably one of the most consistent players in the league the last seven, eight years. So, yeah, that's kind of insane. But uh, hopefully this year, you know, it's not just him. So he was the only one on the team. Now, he was carrying, he's been carrying those guys the last, I said, four or five years. I mean, he just willed them to win games, go 10 and five, when they should have been like five and seven and probably been able to get some draft choices. So, but he's he's just been uh, all way overachiever in, in the entire National Football League for the last, I'd say, five years. He is – Without a doubt, one of the best players in the league, and he should have won an MVP. I thought it's the year that they won the Super Bowl. So we have uh, uh, head coach Mike Zimmerman right now on uh, with his live press conference. Oh boy! Oh boy! That's my cue. Uh <laughs> so, Mr. Ricky, you would take so you're saying you would take Russell Wilson over Aaron Rodgers right now? Right now, yeah. Without a doubt. No hesitation. Right now, absolutely. <laughs> and I mean, I do like, I, I love Rodgers. He can throw the ball too, but this kid is just, I mean, he, he runs when he has to run, he throws and he does everything. He's been just done everything right. So what do you think about the whole situation with Philadelphia with the whole struggle with the offense and Carson Wentz? What do you think they should do? Uh, maybe blow it up and start all over again. <laughs> 
sometimes you just have those kind of years, man, and it's not you can. It's, there is nothing you can do about it. You got injury, and you got your all pro tackle block and making a block, and you finally get a breakthrough. You throw a seventy yard touchdown pass, and he's got caught holding, and he's never had one penalty in the last three years. It's like just certain times that things happen that mm -hmm. way out of your control. It's like you just, you, you just things go wrong that it shouldn't ever go wrong, and that's that's kind of the way they play. Now. I mean. Half the receivers, they this is the second in a row that they can't keep a receiver on the field. You know, they got the tight end, that's it, man. They got guys that they bring up from the practice squad. I mean, they're good players, but I mean, you lose your top line guys at that position at the position like that every year for the last well, last three years, I think they've done that. It's like that's a yeah. tough one, man. Oh, I, have a, I have a question about that. So, like, if, I don't know if you like see like a bunch of players getting injured. But like, do you think that plays into um, them not having a preseason? Yeah, and that in the training camp too. I mean, it's like you know, sometimes you, you know, you don't just go down there and tackle and hit people just for the sake of doing it. I mean, you know, you got to get used to that. It's like like anything else. It's like you prepare yourself for things that you know is going to happen, and if you don't prepare yourself for them, you never get ready. I why like some of these guys, the defensive guys, defensive back guys, they you know, run seven on seven with the drills and you can't tackle them, just reach and touch them, let them know you're there. That's a lot of the stuff that happens the first four or five games of the year. And you look at it, and everybody's getting pulled hamstring like my friends say. Everybody pumps up and look like Tarzan. and they start playing like Jane. You know, you got to <laughs> – you can't just build yourself up. You got to stretch and make sure you're like, okay. I've never in my life heard of people pulling like the killers like they do. Now, you'd have one or two – when I was playing one or two every three years, somebody happened to people. It's like nobody stretches. Nobody ever want to be all pumped up and look like they just left the gym. And they don't stretch the muscles out. And that's where they get poor hamstrings and the groin muscles and all those tight little muscle twitch muscles. They pulling and hurting because they're not stretching or practicing. Do you, think, do you think it was a bad decision that the Carolina Panthers moved on from Cam? And do you think Teddy Bridgewater uh, could be a decent quarterback, if not like maybe a better quarterback within the next three years of his contract? Teddy Bridgewater was here. Love Teddy Bridgewater. <clears throat> could be, I, you know, I wouldn't say he'd be uh, all pro every year. Probably could make all pro a couple of times, a couple, three or four years in his career, but just steady, steady, steady. If you don't need him to win every game for you, steady. Cam Newton, another chair hand, could win every game for you. It's just, you know, it's just, it's just there. You know, it's a difference in that. And, and I think that they did a little, uh, I, I, the new coach just didn't want to have to deal with that problem. I'm sure they said they want to start him out with his people and get him his own people that he can talk to. When you come from college, you got a superstar like that. It's just sometimes it's hard to go out and try to tell him what to do or demand that he do this this way, this way, or that way. You know, when you get a, a, a guy that's not supposed to be playing and you can teach him your way of playing, and that helps everybody on the team. But yeah, Cam Newton is like a, you know, you won't see a quarterback like that come in the league once every 10 years, maybe, you know, so it's a, it's a tough deal. That's a tough call. I wouldn't have let him go, but, you know, maybe he didn't want to be there. Something that something happened there within that organization that led them to believe that he didn't want to be a part of that team anymore. But he was, he's, watch him. He'll watch him with Bill Belichick. He knows how to win. They put, if Belichick was in Atlanta, you'd have won a Super Bowl, another Super Bowl, and you'd be probably like, <laughs> Julio <laughs> oh Ridley and all those guys they got in that place, man, it's like wow. They they should be able to outscore you fifty to forty, whatever it is. I'm just telling you, it's just so it's you, a lot of coaching right now. In do you think Julio time or Julio Jones' time is up then? No, 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 no. If they trade, if they trade Julio Jones, no, that no, oh, no. how would they trade Julio? That'd be the biggest thing they ever did. And well, be, yeah, it's bad if that Super Bowl loss. No, they won't do that. They should. Got one last question. The offense is fine. It's just the defense. It's that defense. Yeah. It's the defense. And the coach. <laughs> yep. It's Dan Quinn. And he's a defensive coach. That's how he got his job, being a defense coordinator. You'd think he'd be able to fix that first. No. Word. Right, oh he was God. Seattle's defensive coordinator. <laughs> I'm an old uh, stage manager, you know. All right, we're coming down on 10 minutes. <laughs> like 10 minutes. All right, flash cars. Cute All right. Cut. No. <laughs> I got one more question, sir. Um, when you was getting drafted in your in green room, what they call, um, what was going through your mind? Who would you think was going through your mind when 
he was getting drafted. Like, this is really it. Greed rule. He kidding. <laughs> <laughs> he's he he's young. He doesn't know. Dormitory. He had a payphone in your dormitory that they called you on. And you were probably in your room up there sleeping or something. Somebody come beat on your door and tell you, hey, Vince, you got a phone call. That's <laughs> <laughs> you probably know do you? <laughs> you know they what a phone booth? That's what we had. Now, you didn't have no green roof. <laughs> I wish I would have been in the green roof. <laughs> now, they just called you up on the phone and say, listen, we drafted you this round. Oh, okay, thank you. You hang up and then they said, okay. take it, come fly out there. That was it. There was no yeah. rules. Uh, what's the most memorable memorable like moment of your entire playing career? God, it had something to do with, with us beating Dallas. I think it was 1982. We played at the Metrodome and the roof caved in on us. It was like New Year's Day. It was a Monday night game, but it was like New Year's, right after New Year's. I remember we had been over to the mine house at New Year's and we had a little party and uh, went to practice the next day, which would have been like a sad, no Sunday practice. And we all was like messing around and the coach and everybody at home and said, and Bud Grant was the coach. He says, listen, I don't know what you did, but this is what we're gonna do. And I've never heard him raise his voice in the whole time I was playing. I don't know if you know, but like scared me. So I left, I never took off my football uniform. I drove home, went home, took a nap, slept in my football uniform, went back to practice. And the night we came back and um, Monday night football, and we wound up beating Dallas on the last play of the game. Something crazy. That's the night Tony Dorsey went 99 and a half yards on us <laughs> to put him ahead. And we finally found a way to come back and win that game. And then that got us in the playoffs. That was a straight short year. I think it may have been like 83, 83. And that was probably one of the most memorable games of my career. If you could have a do over, if you could go back and do anything over again. What would it be? Would have been born 30 years later, and I'd be somewhere right now. Well, uh, about a 50 million dollar contract, <laughs> 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 and waiting to go home, waiting to retire. Three years, or however long that contract has to be done with this game. No, I, I, I would say, I, if I could go back. <sighs> I, I wanted so much to play with uh, with uh, Walter when we were, we were both before we got drafted. I was we were in Chicago, and I'll never forget my college coaches back then. They said, "Well, we think we're going to try to see if we can draft. We're going to draft Walter in the first first round." And one of the coaches reached to draft Ricky. So let me tell you something. I've had both of those guys on my team for four years. Really good football players, but you get them together, and you got a you talk about you got a headache on your damn hands. <laughs> so I would have liked to play with him, I think, for one year if I could have before I retired, if I could go back and do anything because of his tragic, tragic loss, the death of it's like one of the best people I've ever been around, best guys, human being ever. And I'm going to tell you a story about you talk about a guy that's a trooper. He was staring with me. We got down to the Mayo Clinic when he had the liver cancer. And we go back, we go down there every two days. We had to go down there for treatment stuff. So. When we go in there and the doctor, I know these guys have been in us with, he said, hey, Walter, I got, you know, it's okay, Rick is standing. He said, yeah, yeah. So he said, I got good news and bad news. And he's laughing and BSing and stuff. And that's like nothing's wrong with him. And I said, we got good news and we got bad news, Walter. So what is that? He said, well, oh, we found a liver for you. I said, liver cancer. And we found a liver for you and a donor and we could be, we could do this like, oh, that was like on a Wednesday. So we could do it by Friday. And he says, well, what, what, what kind of odds? What's the chances, guys? He said, well, he said, you know what? It's, it's what we saw before is that it's now spreading around. And he said, but at least you can live another maybe eight months of quality of life. And Walter says, guys, he says, hey. he said, just sew me back up and give it to somebody that's with better odds. I'm like, I'm telling you, I just, I've never crashed hard in my life. I'm like, and he didn't flinch, didn't say a word, nothing the whole way home. I'm like, wow. <laughs> It's just like, you know, he says, I can't take that for eight months. He goes, well, give it to somebody else that better, better look and find somebody that match, better match for it and, and that's got a better odds than that. And I'm like, how many people you know might say that to you? <laughs> and that's the way he lived. He was a good man all the way through. Good, good guy. That's a moment. <laughs> well, 
Okay, so we're winding down here. Anybody else? Let's just, I want you to make sure you all get your questions. No more Falcons question, I can't. <laughs> Our, our little talk show next, our little chat, our class chat. <laughs> All you got to do, Miss Cat, is just Green Bay. Email out his email his number. Oh, yeah. Give him the number. You can ask some more questions, comment up. She'll give you my number. That is actually, that's something that I can brag about. <laughs> <laughs> no, I figured my team warning. Semester, guys, I figured that um, we'll, this is basically our little talk show. So we're you know, if you have anybody you want to come on or, um, you know, basically, you know, you just go go DM people, slide in their DMs and say, hey, come to class. Let's talk sports. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you guys like that idea? Yeah. yeah. It's our answer to COVID. Normally, um, Ricky, I would be uh, on last year. I sent them out to the school games to, um, to write about the school games. But I think this is... Um, a lot more real, real world experience um, happening here, you know, yeah. real conversations. However, you can get it, man. Nothing beat experience, let me tell you that. If you can get it without being hurt, you've done a good job. <laughs> well, I'm so grateful for you to be being here. Um, like I said, we're, we're starting to wind down a little bit. Daryl, you doing okay? You went blank there. <laughs> he might be eating his lunch. Yes. Um, yeah, Sean, you doing okay? Everybody, all right? Any any other questions you want to start hey, watching? Down? What do you want to? I might, do? I'll probably end up calling or texting him more questions because I might need to get I might need your little little story about him for being in. <laughs> all right, oh. and I apologize for last week, guys. I just uh, it's just a lot of things came up, so I apologize, okay. guys, for missing last week. So, hey, um, Cameron, I would appreciate it if you would do something for being in, like that he was appeared in our class and and. Mm -hmm. I that I took, and um, that would be a really yeah. I can do it. I just got to set up a time where I can interview him. No, that's not a problem at all. Okay. Nope. Yeah, just that he appeared in our class, and you know that we, you know. Okay, that's not a good, not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> good guys, you guys are good people. <laughs> yeah, this like this is like one of my best. I know I brag on guys. Don't get your head too big, but I do brag on these guys quite. Yeah, a lot. you did. You did a little bit. That's why I decided to come on. She bragged you guys up so. She wasn't lying, though. You guys are good guys. Good people. Yeah. Okay. So are we ready to wind us down? Yeah. Okay. All right, guys. Peace out. Let me know on the deal. Okay. Right. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you. Have a good one, guys. Keep working hard, though. There's nothing going to replace that. You always say? get where you want to yes, go. Sir. Yes, sir. All right, man. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you enough. Thanks again. It's good meeting you. You bet. Pleasure's all good. I'll see you in Minnesota. <laughs> Thank you. I'll be here. All right, guys. All right. All right. All right. All right. In the meeting.